Well, I, I come from a, a farming family. Uh, all my, all, most of my cousins are farmers still. Um, I uh, saw an opportunity to enter politics when I was very young because of a redistricting that was done in our area. I could see that there was a risk that if I didn't move quickly, the seat would be taken by somebody else and I'd never have a chance to stand for Parliament. So at the age of 21, I sought my party's nomination and obtained it and I was then elected um, when I was just turned 22 years of age. Uh, I, I served in government uh, during the 1970s, the 1980s and again in the 1990s. I served in the Department of Education, served in industry, trade, commerce, tourism, energy and twice as Minister for Finance. Uh, then in the 1990s the opportunity came about for a new government to be formed as a result of the breakup of a previous government in 1994 and I became the Prime Minister of a three-party coalition uh, which uh, was a very cohesive government. It didn't win the subsequent election but it came very close to doing so against all the odds and in that time when I was Prime Minister the Irish Celtic Tiger uh, took off. Uh, our growth rate went from a little over 2% to 11% in the year that I ceased to be Prime Minister. Obviously the roots of that growth go a lot further back than that brief period that I was Prime Minister but uh, it's uh, obviously something that we are very proud of in Ireland that we were able to create such a dynamic economy. Well even still as we speak 60% uh, of the world's uh, income is earned either in the United States or in Europe. 40% is earned in the rest of the world. Between us we constitute not much more than about 12% of the world, world's population but we earn 60% of the world's income. Uh, so we're still very important Europeans and Americans. Obviously trade in goods and services isn't the most important part of the relationship between Europe and America. We do, both of us, a lot of trading with China, with India and things like that. The relationship between Europe and America is more a relationship of ownership or investment. There's a huge European investment in the United States. Many, many American household names, when you go behind them, are actually owned by European shareholders. And the same is the case in Europe. Many apparently European firms are actually American owned. What that means is that if things go badly for the United States, that's very bad for Europe because we're, the value of what we own is going down because of difficulties being faced in the United States. And precisely the equivalent is the case in the other direction. If things go badly in Europe, that reduces the value of American assets. So what we've got to do to work together is to manage this investment relationship is ensure that we both prosper, that we don't have inefficient duplication of regulations, that we have the maximum simplicity for people who want to invest on the other side of the Atlantic, and that we organize our politics to sustain economic prosperity and deal with long-term structural problems in an organized way rather than postponing them to the last minute. I think it's very unlikely that the European Union will become like the United States in this important sense. The European Union is structured on the basis that any member state can withdraw. The United States, as we know, as became very clear in 1861, is structured differently. No state may secede from the United States once it joins. That changes the dynamic, so to speak. In the case of the European Union, Obviously, no law is going to be made that is so radically disadvantageous to one state that that state might contemplate withdrawing. Therefore, the European Union is not going to develop in the centralised way uh, that the United States has developed. But for a whole lot of things, we're finding increasingly that it's convenient for us and indeed for our partners like the United States, that we do things together as a European Union rather than separately as 27 states. Uh, whether it be energy policy, whether it be protecting the environment, whether it be regulating aircraft noise, it 
makes more sense to have a single European norm than to be trying to do it separately. And for the United States in its turn, when it comes to want to do business in Europe, it's much more efficient to be able to do one bit of business to cover all 27 countries than to have to make 27 different agreements with 27 different countries. There is this difference in the sort of socio-economic model that applies in most but not all European countries and the one that is traditionally associated with the United States. Europeans, if you like, put more emphasis on security, security of employment, uh, making it more difficult for people to lose their jobs, which in turn, of course, means that it, employers are much less willing to create new jobs because of this. The United States puts more emphasis on freedom, the freedom to create a new job, the freedom to get rid of somebody uh, when you don't need them. Uh, and that difference is reflected in the social models. The reality of it is, I suppose, people need a bit of both. Most people like to have some job security. Now, they do want to have the freedom to move to another job. So some combination of the two models is probably good. The idea that everybody in their lives only wants one thing, and that's more money, without regard to security, that isn't really a accurate description of humanity either, any more than the idea that people would be satisfied with security without freedom. The European Union countries and the United States have no concern as such about Iran having a peaceful nuclear industry. Certainly they have a large oil industry, so they have sources of energy apart from nuclear, but if they want to hedge their bets and have a nuclear industry, that's not a problem for any of us. The problem is if they are developing nuclear weapons and enriching uranium to the point that is, is capable of being used. And the only justification for doing so would be for use in a weapon. That's the worry that we have because that creates a situation uh, where you could have proliferation and where other neighbors of Iran, in addition to Pakistan and Russia and India who already have nuclear weapons, that other uh, of their uh, neighbors, such as in the Arab world, would say, well, if the Iranians have a nuclear weapon, we've got to have one too, and you have an out-of-control nuclear arms race. And of course, the more countries that have nuclear weapons, the greater is the risk that somebody, uh, in some provo provocative situation, might actually use them, and then we're on a very, very dangerous path. So I think it's very important that we work together to persuade Iran that its security can be guaranteed and its history respected and its people respected without their having to take a nuclear weapons option.